Shalom, and welcome to Christian's Hebrew Connection, the teaching ministry of Gary Huff and the Hebraic Christian community and Israel, a ministry devoted to restoring the biblical Hebraic heritage of the Christian faith. Today's program, here are your hosts, Gary and Darlene Huff. We're going to continue with our Torah portion, the weekly Torah portion. We have a special one this week. It is the Torah portion, Naso, N-A-S-O, Naso. It's translated in our English as the word count, in a lot of translations, count. And of course, it's in the book of Numbers, so they're counting. They're getting ready to leave, or they have... Uh, started to depart, leaving Mount Sinai after the commandments of God was given in the book of Exodus chapter 19 through 24. He gives it, and then in verse uh, chapter 25 of Exodus, Moses saw the, the, the design of what Stephen in the book of Acts said was the church in the wilderness that we know is the tabernacle. So yes, at Mount Sinai, the church, the design of it, we can find at Mount Sinai at the first Pentecost. We can find that. Then the book of Leviticus, as we explained, is a year-long stay at the foot of the mountain. Now that they have the, the house of God, it's time to ordain and train the ministers, the ones that are called of God. Not ones that called themselves, but the ones that God called, God said, we're going to train them. We're going to anoint them. We're going to sanctify the house. God starts the first fire in the house of God. If you bring strange fire in, we know by evidence that God nukes you. These ministers in the book of Leviticus, what happened? The sons of Aaron, they bring strange fire in, not God's fire, and God nuked them. So it's dangerous to bring your own fire into the house of God. God starts the fire. Even Jeremiah says that there's fire shut up in my bones, and not all the time did he enjoy that because God asked his minister to do thing, uh, things a lot of times that they don't want to do. Send somebody else. Nope, nope, it's time that we all take our place. It's time that we all answer the call of whatever God is telling. And, and I think that's a big problem that we're facing in America today that God's people uh, are not doing what God told them to do. And uh, everybody has a job. Everybody has a calling. The Bible declares that. Let's just start doing that and let's see what we can do unified. Is that right? Unified what we can do. So in the book of Numbers, it's time for them to leave. And what was the sign that they were going to leave? The cloud that was upon the house of God, the Shekinah Kavod, the glory of God, would lift itself off of the house of God and it would move. And they had to be ready to go in a split second. They already had to be trained how to pack things up. It sat there until the time that they were ready and it's time to go. I think that's a good lesson for us today as a church. When the cloud moves, it's time for us to be ready to go, to be prepared because there's a, another preparation that we ought to be preparing for. It is the coming of the Son of Man. The return of Jesus, I believe, a trip in space is about to take place, and that's a good place to say amen. At least that should be our prayer. It might be another 10,000 years. I don't know. But I've got a sense when we start studying the Scriptures, he says, when you see these things begin to happen, he says, start looking up. Why? Because your redemption draweth nigh, it's even at the door. So I see a lot of things happening. And uh, all those messages were messages for his church. He was speaking to his disciples. So I believe we can start looking up. And, and you can tell I'm a little bit excited about that because we can either stay here with everything going on or we can be walking streets of gold. <laughs> now let's see which line am I going to be in. I'm going to be in that long line. Now, I don't have a death wish. I want to occupy till Jesus comes. Paul said he had the same idea. He said he was betwixt two opinions, whether to go or whether to stay. 
He said, it's better that I go on. He wanted to go on, but it's better for you that I stay. So he said, yes, Lord, whatever you called me to do, and when I finish that course, I'm ready to go. And he said that, didn't he? He said that he'd finished his course, he'd run the race, now there's a crown of righteousness. Think about those words. There's a crown of righteousness laid up in store for me. You see that? His heart was was on two things. He had a desire to go. He was ready and he was willing and he wanted to go, but he also had a heart for God's people. And he wanted to teach them until that day, and he did. Man, what a great testimony. I hope we can leave this, this earth when God calls us home with that same kind of testimony, don't you? I want to be like that. I want to be found faithful because he says this in the words that I long to hear more than anything else. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I make you ruler over me. I'm not, I'm not interested in being ruler over a whole lot of things, but I want to be found faithful. He's going to say what? Enter in, my good and faithful servant. I long to hear those words. So we're going to occupy to his come, and we're going to be full of joy. Now the enemy don't want you to have joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. So he does everything he can to take your joy away. But we refuse, and we're going to be joyful in the Lord. Why not? The only people that has a right on the planet, the whole planet Earth, to be joyful is God's people that he's redeemed by the blood of his precious son. So we are to have a shouting spell. I'm happy to be in the Lord. Know that he's in me and I'm in him and he said I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you through the tough times, through the good times, through the valleys, through the mountains. I'm gonna go with you until the end of age. Hallelujah. I believe that so much that I've, I've banked everything on that promise, but it ain't just a hope so. I believe it's a no so. I know my Redeemer lives. Hallelujah. We better get into the Torah portion or maybe we should save that for another time. But I'm excited about this because we're learning so much about how the New Testament unfolds. Now in our last time, we introduced some things, that, not to our congregation, we've talked about these for years, but to a lot of viewing of, uh, audience out there is uh, something called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. And uh, now don't get afraid of that word. That's, that's just a big word like mayonnaise. That's all. It just means the methodology in which, which you study the scriptures. Okay, the two, we're going to use the same two that we used last time about the mountains and about Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses. It is, uh, the first one is called Gezra Sheva. Gezra Sheva, okay? And it is uh, the equivalence of a decree. That's what those two Hebrew words mean. The equivalence, the equal. It's, uh, it's a method of finding associated passages of scriptures in one place in the Bible and that it has a link in another passage and you, it, it's the method of bringing those two things together to bring a better understanding across the board. Now, if you want to see Jesus using this, everyone knows when the lawyer asks Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Okay, what is the first commandment at all? And what did he say? Exactly what we usually say here in the congregation with Tim, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Vahavta et Adonai, Elohecha, Bakalavavka, Uvaka, Netzaka, Uvaka, Modika. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might or your resources. Now, that comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Then Jesus uses this hermeneutic. He goes to the book of Leviticus chapter 19, and he says, there's, there's something that is a, a, no less great that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. So he went to two different places and said, it is equally important to love your neighbor as much as you love God. They're equal across the board. Matter of fact, Jesus says this, whatsoever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. So if you want to love Jesus, how about loving your neighbor? It's like loving him. You see that? But that is a Gezra Sheva. Now, the another one that we're going to be using uh, in this teaching is the one that we used in our last teaching. It's called a Ramez. Ramez. It's the second one in a second set of hermeneutics called Pardes. 
Remez, and it means hint. And I'm going to use Mark today as a, as a witness here, and we're going to try this Remez, this hint. If I say unto him this, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, you shall reap. See, it was something that both of us knew, and all I had to do was hint, and then he got the message. So Jesus uses this remez, or this type of hermeneutic, probably more than any of the rest of them. But we have to recognize them when we say, and he uses it. Matter of fact, there's a, a problem with the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. If you don't use, it doesn't make sense, and even our English translation the, the King James leaves the word out because it doesn't make sense, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, the New King James leaves it out because it doesn't understand what's going on. And our seminary teachers don't understand it either because they make things up that's not so much true, okay? The NIV actually leaves it in, but it doesn't make sense unless you use this hermeneutic. Gezerah Sheva, we do that teaching. Now, if you know what that is, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense, and we'll do that teaching sometime when we get into more hermeneutics. There's a lot of things that we need to understand before we understand the, the words of Jesus as we see today, okay? Now, the reason why I think this is so unique, we will be studying our Torah portion as a foundation, not so count, but we're going to do as we did last time. We're going to go to the New Testament and find out the foundation of something that Jesus was doing that sometimes we miss if we don't know the Torah portion. And we're going to talk about an event that at the time of this video, when we're recording it, a great event has just taken place. Pentecost is coming up in a week at this time. Okay? But this past Thursday, if we've been counting the Omer, was the 40th day. This is the 40th day from the Feast of First Fruits when Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And what happened on the 40th day after he was resurrected? He ascended out of sight with the promise of a return. Guess what? At the time of this recording, that happened this Thursday was the anniversary of that with the promise. And sometimes we have to hear the, the two men robed in white why are you still looking up? For this same Jesus that went away will come again in like manner. We look for him to return, and he will return because he said he would. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to read that. But everything that we read in the book of Luke chapter 24, we're going to use as a hint and as a Gezra Sheva that before we can see really what Jesus is doing when he ascended on, on uh, the Mount of Olives on the 40th day, before we can understand the things that's going on, we have to look back to this week's Torah portion, not so. And it gives us everything that we want to know about what is going on on that 40th day. Does that sound important? Because there's a lot more that's going on than what we have formerly known, and you must know first century hermeneutics to understand it. And when we apply those, you'll see things that we've probably never seen before. And this is uh, new to me too. Okay, so uh, uh, God just gave me this this week. So let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter 24, and we begin in verse 46. And remember, this is the 40th day after he was resurrected. Okay. Verse 46 says this, Then he, Jesus, said to them, Thus it is written. I wonder where he's written. Right before this, he said, It is written in the law of Moses, it's written in the prophets, and in the writings, okay, which is all the Hebrew scripture. So everything about this resurrection and the death, burn, resurrection, we can find in the Hebrew scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Wow, you mean you can find that in the Hebrew Scriptures? Sure you can. Verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations. Now the nations here is Goyim. What should be preached after the death, burn, and resurrection of Jesus? What should we be preaching in the house of God? to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance. 
And man, you don't hear that message too often today. But here our Savior, our Lord Christ, the Son of God, declares that the ministers that he has chosen is to preach repentance and remission of sin. Amen. That settles it for me. Jesus said, how can you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Well, you can't. Right? So here, let me read that again. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all the Goyim, to the Gentiles. But look where it begins. Beginning at Jerusalem. Now, this is important why this is the beginning of this. Not just that it's because it's to the Jew first and then the Greek. It's not just that. It is seen that Israel is the heartbeat of the world. It's the reason why it becomes a stumbling stone to many nations. It is the heart of God because most people don't understand this. The land of Israel doesn't belong to the Jews. It belongs to God. And he chose the Jews to be good stewards of it. You see that? There's a lot to that. But if Israel is the heart of this world, the heartbeat, the temperature of the world, what's going on in the world, Jerusalem is seen as the navel. This is where life begins, the navel, what attaches to the life giver. Even the word of the Lord shall come forth from where? Jerusalem. The word of life does that. Jesus was resurrected in Jerusalem where all life began. Amen. So it must begin right where it started in Jerusalem. Verse 48. And you are witnesses, and I'm saying this to our congregation, everyone who's been born again, and you are witnesses of these things. Then he says in verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now, we're not going to be able to get to that, but that's a whole teaching in itself to understand what that promise is and what it is not. He said, I will send the promise of my Father upon you. <clears throat> What's interesting is there is no Hebrew word for a promise. Wait, Gary, I find it in the English Bible everywhere, but there is no Hebrew word for promise. It is the word debar, D-A-B-A-R, debar. Every time it appears, it is the word for the word. What's he saying? I will send my word of the Father upon you. <laughs> wow. He didn't do away with it, did he? And this is after the death, burn, and resurrection. He's going back to the Father. I'm going to send you the word. Not just any word. I'm going to send you the same word that you've had before that was given at Mount Sinai. And I'm going to give it to you. How about that? And he's, who's he sending it to? even the nations, the Gentiles, as well as the Jews. But he says here, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, the navel, until you are endued with power from on high. Now, we've preached everything except what that is. Endued is Elizabethan English. It comes from the Greek word enduo. It comes from the Hebrew word lavash, and it means to put on a coat. Put a jacket on. Put a garment on. Wait until you get the garment that comes from heaven that is the word of God, your covering. And if you've got a Hebrew mind, this is your talit or your garment that comes with the seat seat, the tassels on the edges that represents the 613 commandments. Wait after I'm uh, resurrected, the death, burn, resurrection, until you get the garment of the Torah. Wow, that's pretty good, ain't it? Until you're endued with power from on high, verse 50. Then he did something after he said that. And he led them out as far as Bethany. Bethany, Beth is the Hebrew word for house. Ani is the word for poor. So he led them out to, and matter of fact, Bethany is on the backside of uh, the Mount of Olives. On the Jerusalem side of it, it's got vegetation because they get a lot of rain. But why is Bethany poor? Because they get no rainfall. Nothing won't grow. So it, they have nothing to trade with. There's a lot of thieves and robbers. You have to go by the Jericho Road where you might get mugged. If you go down through there like the good Samaritan found out on the road uh, to Jericho, 
So it was a place still on the Mount of Olives, though. And he led them out as far as the Mount of Olives or Bethany. And he lifted up his hands. Everybody say lifted up his hands. And he lifted up his hands and he, for what purpose? To bless them. To bless them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem because he told them to with great joy and were uh, continually in the temple praising and blessing God. That's interesting because we have been taught uh, for many, many years that the reason why the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom when Jesus died because God was destroying the temple worship, the temple system, and it was God striking at that old way. Well, that's just not the truth. What did the, the first apostles do? They found their way while they were tearing in, uh, in Jerusalem. They continually were in the temple service. We need to find out what that is. Don't you think? That's going to be our reading for today. And we've got a lot to get to, and I hope we can get to it all in one message. But we'll see. We'll see what God wants to do. I'm just happy today. I have the joy of the Lord today, and it is my strength today. It will crush every yoke. Hallelujah. I hope you are full of joy too. So, Darlene, let's go on over to the PowerPoint. And we'll start like this because we read from the book of Luke here. But there's something that we have to know. From the pen of Dr. Luke, we actually have two books in the New Testament that he penned, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And yes, he was a doctor. Now let me say this. All of the writers that God used for Holy Scriptures, the 66 books, were Jewish. With the exceptions, and there is a slight chance that Luke is not. But at at best or at worst, he's a proselyte because he knows the Torah inside and out. Paul used him as as someone who would write down the words in the book of Acts for him. So from the pen of Dr. Luke, you have to keep that in mind because they're mere images of each other. Luke is before the resurrection or the ascension. The book of Acts is after the ascension. But he still penned both, okay? It's very, very important to understand this. So let's go on. Here in the book of Luke, what does it say that we just read? Well, first we've got to find ourselves on the Mount of Olives. And some of us, a lot of us, has been here many times. The Bible says that Jesus took his disciples out to the Mount of Olives or Bethany. Here in Luke 24, 50 that we just read, Jesus led them out as far as Bethany. That's on the backside, okay, where the Arba, the the Jordan River Basin, where the hot air comes up from out of the Negev, from the desert, and nothing grows there, which is the Mount of Olives. And he did what? First, he instructs us to understand that he lift up his hands And then, for what purpose? To bless them. Now remember, this is going to help us with our Torah portion, not so. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Here is Jesus, as we're looking at uh, what the text, what Luke is actually telling us. Here, he lifted his hand for the purpose of blessing them. Now, what Jesus is using here for the trained studier, the equipped one, Jesus is using this week's Torah portion, Naso, that's translated as count in our English. And that's a pretty good translation, but there's other translations. But how many knows when you read it in Hebrew, there's things there that's not normally understood because one of the big problems we have in English, and it's, it's okay, English and Greek, it's very noun-oriented. Everything is a thing. Hebrew is very verb-oriented. That is action. It's not just the knowledge of something or the existence of something, but it is actually the verb of what that thing wants you to do, which that thing, I, don't, I shouldn't use that word, is God, what God wants you to do. What is, what is the, the, the point of what's being said? Now, in Hebrew, the word naso can be count. 
and, and it's, it's okay. But here's a better translation in our Torah portion. Lift up. This is the blessing of the lifting up of two things, the head and the lifting up of hands. And both is for the purpose of blessing. Right? And we're going to find out how important this is. Now we're going to look through the viewfinder of what Jesus is doing in the book of Luke chapter 24 from the first line of our Torah portion, not so. Okay? Let's read that. In uh, Numbers chapter 4, beginning in verse 21 and 22, it says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, Moses, saying, Also take a census of the sons of Gershom. Gershom. <clears throat> so here we have a, the taking of a census here. That, that gives us the understanding that count is all right. Take a count. But the Hebrew doesn't actually say that, and somebody's going to recognize this real quick. When we read this passage in the first verse of our Torah portion, also take a census of the sons of Gershon. Now, this is the way the passage looks in Hebrew, and this is so important because we're thinking verbs now instead of nouns. Okay? This is how you transliterate this passage. There's our word, naso, et rosh, b'nei gershon. And how does it translate in our English? Also take a census of the sons of gershon. But for you who know Hebrew, there's some words that's not lining up here, is it? Naso et rosh, b'nei gershon. So let's break this down and see what the actual incentive, God's incentive of, of saying this to Moses. And Moses plays a big part of this. The first, we've got to see who he's writing to or who he's saying it to. Here it says the sons of Gershon. Sons is a good translation. It is translated from the word b'nai. But it's more than that. It's just not in the masculine, and we, we, I won't spend time with that. If you're speaking to a mixed congregation in Hebrew, you would always speak in the masculine. Because in Hebrew, there's the feminine and the masculine. If you're talking to a woman... You say things this way, you talk to a man, you speak this way in Hebrew. <clears throat> but if it's a mixed congregation, you always speak in the masculine. So here it says the sons. But how many knows that there was more in this tribe than just sons? And how many believe that God also wants to bless the women? Proverbs 31, woman, go look at that. So sons doesn't really tell us what is going on here? The word b'nai is the word really should be translated for us English understanders as the children, which is both male and female, okay? Now, the next one that's translated as senses makes really no sense at all because it's translated here as et rosh. Et usually doesn't even translate into English anything in most cases, but here it can be the word the, which is a definite article, a specific thing. Senses is not the word rosh. Our people know what the word rosh is. It's like if you know something about the feast of God, you would think about Rosh Hashanah, Happy New Year, or Rosh Chodesh, the new moon. Rosh doesn't mean new. What does it mean, congregation? Head, right? Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. I don't know why he is translated in our English as senses, probably because of what was going on in the text, but literally it doesn't say that. So it should be this, literally in Hebrew, the head, the children. Are we seeing something develop here? And let's go to the name of our Torah portion, Naso. It's translated here as take which is okay. Count is okay. But a better translation in the text is this word. And look what we're seeing that is hidden if you don't read Hebrew. Lift up the heads of the children. For what purpose? To bless. What did Jesus do when he ascended? He lifted up his hands, but their heads were lifted up. For what purpose? 
to be blessed. Two things going on here. Gershon is, is, is funny also. Who is Gershon? Well, they are the sons of Levi. So that means they are Jewish priests. They're of the priesthood, right? So are we only talking about the Jewish people here? Well, what does the word Gershon mean? The root word ger comes from the, has the same root as the word goyim. And the word goy, ger, is the word for what? Gentile. So is this blessing of the lifting up the hands and lifting up the head, is it only reserved for Jewish people? No. Is that right? Jew and Gentile. Matter of fact, the word Gershom, this priesthood, his name actually means the stranger. So let's read the text again. Lift up the head of the children of the strangers, both Jew and Gentile, for what purpose? To bless all. Wow, that's pretty good, ain't it? I'm glad he didn't count us out. Amen. So now the importance of Hebrew, this is just another tool that we use. <coughs> Naso should be translated as lift up, right? And that's what Jesus was doing. So he is doing everything that our Torah portion is about. What is it? The blessing of the lifting up of the heads and lifting up of the hands. And Jesus did both this past Thursday was the anniversary of when he did that for both Jew and Gentile. Who was supposed to get the message preached to them? Preached repentance and the remission of sin to all the Gentiles. Coming right from this text. Is that pretty cool or what? How important are these things? But again, this is hermeneutics that is hinting at something. You see that? So we need to know this. Now, as we've seen in the beginning, the book of Luke is before Jesus. It is the count before what happened before he ascended. But the book of Acts <coughs> that Luke actually uh, wrote also, penned, it gives us the event of after he ascended. So Acts chapter 1 really needs to be read in conjunction with Luke chapter 24. It's like the before and after. And I don't like them pictures on TV. Before, after, before, after. You know that they're photoshopped. <laughs> but here we have accurate from the same man writing about the same event from two different perspectives, before and after, and he's writing it to the same guy, a man by the name Old Theophilus. Now, we're not going to get into what, who he is, but it's interesting when you, when you study it, <clears throat> who he is. So we have to study these in conjunction with one another. Here it says at the same event in the book of Acts, this is how the book of Acts begins. And you need to know this. If we're going to study the book of Acts, you have to know what you're getting ready to learn right now, and very few do. Here Luke tells us the former account I made. Now he's talking about the book of Luke. And who's he writing to? O Theophilus, two Greek words, Phyllis and Theo. Of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. You see that? Until the day which he was taken up, ascended in Luke 24. Okay? So what you're studying here in Acts chapter number 1 is these two things. What Jesus began to do and teach. So when you start reading Acts number 1, and hardly anybody ever reads Acts 1, what did they do? They skip over to Acts 2. But I'm going to show you, if you do that, you don't know what Acts 2, you don't know anything about it. And you'll make up things as we've done for 1,700 years. I want to show you the things that you need to know if you're going to even approach Acts 2. And I'm talking about Pentecost, which is coming up here in a week. You have to know chapter 1, because what comes after chapter 1? Chapter 2, every time. So we have here what Jesus did and what he taught, okay, in Acts chapter number 1. So let's see how Luke approaches this. After he, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, had given what? After the death, burn, and resurrection, he gave commandments to the apostles. 
And a lot of people don't like commandments. They said, oh, Gary, you don't need those 613. Oh, okay. Well, guess how many uh, commandments that Jesus gave in the New Testament? Almost 1,100. And a lot of people don't like commandments, but it's just the truth. Right? How can you call me Lord and do not the things I say? And what does he say? If you love me, keep. Wow. Right from the mouth of Jesus. Here, even during this 40 days, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to his apostles. In the book that we have it recorded here in Acts 1, <clears throat> whom he had chosen. What else can we find out? To whom he also presented himself alive. Now, if you're going to understand what's going on in Luke chapter number one, these are the things that he did and the things that he taught to his apostles. Okay? Here in this congregation, we know that the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead just happened to be the first day of the week called First Fruits on the Feast of First Fruits. Even Paul acknowledges this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, where he said, For Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Here, Jesus resurrected on the Feast of First Fruit. Now, if you don't know what the feasts are, you are already a lost ball in high weeds in chapter number one. And remember, you can't get to chapter number two unless you know chapter one, because it sets up chapter two. Wow. To whom he also presented himself alive on the feast of first fruits after he suffered. Now that is his death in the book of Matthew. All the gospels tell us that Jesus died on the feast of Passover. Are you seeing what Jesus taught to his apostles? The things he did on these feasts. And if we're going to figure out what Acts 2 is all about, we better know what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the feast. If you don't, you have no hope. By the way, how, how does the book of Acts 2 start? Then the day of Pentecost, wait, what's Pentecost? It's another feast. So how do you know the fourth feast without knowing the first one? You don't. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you just don't. <clears throat> and there's no shame in being ignorant of these things, but it's time that we start to be about the Father's business. That's what Luke is telling us, Dr. Luke is telling us. Right? After he suffered, and we know he suffered and died on the feast of Passover. And he, he adds in here, by many infallible proofs, he goes on to say this. Here, in the book of Acts, Acts 2, you have to know these feasts. It's interesting, just like I said, it says, when the day, which is the feast of Pentecost, had fully come. Wow. Wow. So you have to know about the spring feast in Acts 1 because the fourth uh, summer festival of Pentecost is how it begins. And what's interesting here, my translation says the word, it begins with the word when. Yours might say then, it might say and, but it's all a conjunction. If you'll read in your Greek lexicon, the word when and then is this word. It is the word chi. K-A-I. Now that is conjunction, and I hope we know what a conjunction does. It joins two things together. Well, if the, if the book of Acts chapter 2 begins with a conjunction, what is it tying it to? Chapter 1. So it's saying you can't understand this Feast of Pentecost without understanding what's going on in, uh, on in Acts chapter number 1. You don't know it. That's what it's literally saying. Is that too harsh? It's just the truth if we're going to understand these things. And we, we don't have time. I, I believe that a trip in space is about to take place. So we need to get this right. We need to say, you know, this is what it says. Just let it be what it is. And what does the book of Acts chapter 17 talks about? A group of people called Bereans. Paul says that they're more noble than any other people because of this point, that they study the scriptures day and night to see if these things are so. So all I'm asking is for us to be Bereans, to study these things, to see if these things are so. That's pretty good advice, ain't it? Chapter 2 is meant to be studied in the light and the understanding of chapter 1. And we're going to do that. Being seen by them, and here's our 40 days, which Thursday was the anniversary 
during them uh, during the 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of heaven. You see that? What comes after the death, burden, and resurrection? The teaching of the kingdom of heaven. It's not vice versa. And we can do a teaching on that. Malchut ha Elohim on this. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Do you see? This is Luke chapter 24. He's, he's rehashing this. But wait for the promise of the Father. Okay? Wait for the promise of the Father. Now, to us, the word wait means I'm sitting down, ain't doing nothing. That's what most of us men tell our wives when they say you got to go out and clean the garage out or cut the grass. We're waiting <laughs> till the commercial comes on. I ain't doing it. Some people get mad. It's said that the, the church at Thessalonica, when they heard the good news that Jesus was coming back, they sold everything they had and they went and sat down. They was waiting. They wasn't doing anything. I'm a waiting. I'm just waiting till God says something. Well, you know what? Pick up your Bible. We got 66 books of what God said to do. Don't sit down. The word wait. This word comes from Isaiah 40. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You want renewed strength? Well, then what does wait mean? Until that promise comes, the word wait is the word kava. And kava doesn't mean sit down and do nothing. The imagery is twist, twisting together a, a thread, like on the seat seat that represents the commandments of God. In other words, he's saying continue doing the word of God until the promise comes. Don't just sit down and wait. It's not a preservative word. Don't put it on a shelf. Be about the Father's business. Busy yourself with doing what God says to do in his word until that promise comes. And what we do, it will renew your strength. You'll mount up with wings. Hallelujah. And boy, do we need that now. That's what he says, but wait or busy yourself with the things that you've always been doing until that promise comes. Here, look what he says that they've done after he ascended. And they were, what? Continually in the temple praising and blessing God. God was not striking at the temple service as many teach. They continued steadfastly in these things. The book of Acts declares that. Even the Amidah, the, the uh, three hours of prayer, go lead, you will find them in the temple doing what the temple services were doing. So if God didn't hate the temple services, okay? What God had a problem with and I have a problem with is what corrupt leadership does with those things. And that's what Apostle Paul got in trouble over, and I do too, it's okay. So these 40 days, the anniversary is this past Thursday, after his resurrection, Jesus said to busy yourself or wait. Wait for what? Here what you're seeing is a timeline of Acts 1 and Acts 2. This is the very foundation of what Luke said, the things that Jesus began to do and teach. Here's the foundation. Foundation of Luke, I mean, Acts 1 and Acts chapter 2. And how does it start? Well, it starts at Passover when Jesus died. But the reason why I have the 10th up there, because this was a preparation day that's very important also. This is one of the things that Jesus did. If you go back to the first Passover in the book of Exodus chapter 12, you'll find out before the lamb died, he had to be selected. So, so the word of God says on the 10th day you select a one-year-old lamb, but it had to be without spot, without blemish. It could not have any broken bones or it was disqualified to die for the people. So that's the reason why it was selected four days before it died because you were to watch it, inspect it for four days to make sure that it was acceptable or kosher. So they would examine it for four days because on the 14th day of the first month is Passover when the lamb was commanded to die at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now it's funny to me that what Luke is talking about and he says it in his gospel, this 10th day is the same day that Jesus come riding the donkey in. 
Wow. This is one of the pilgrimage festivals in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, where all the Jewish males were supposed to go up to Jerusalem to worship before the, uh, before the Lord. So it's a crowded place, plum full of Jewish people from all over the world. And the if you've been there, Temple Mount's very small. Josephus says at one time there's over 300,000 people on that little mountain there, Bruce. That's a lot of people. And they saw this spectacle here of this man on the 10th day when the priest in the temple was, was checking out to see if this lamb was, was kosher or not that was going to die for the people. How did the people react when they seen Jesus riding this donkey? Their minds went to Zechariah chapter 9, I believe, that the king will come riding on a donkey. So how did these people that lined both sides of the road, thousands of people begin in unison, waving palm branches and making this declaration? They said, Hoshana, Hoshana, Malki ben David. Save us, save us now, O king, our king, son of David. And son of David is code word for Messiah. Who had received him as Messiah? The Jewish people. Wow. They declared it. They threw their robes down to let him ride across it. So the Jewish people received him on this 10th day, Hoshana, Hoshana, Malki ben David. Well, then why was he put to death? Because there was a corrupt leadership that didn't want anything to do with him because he was much too powerful and the people were growing in his following. Things ain't changed just a whole lot. What did they say when he resurrected Lazarus from the dead? What did he say? Man, we got to do something about this Jesus guy because if we don't silence him, the whole world's going to fall after him. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, they'd lose their job. Oh, I'm starting to meddle now, ain't I? Guess what they did when Jesus rode on the 10th day into Jerusalem? Guess what they did? The same priest that was inspecting that little lamb, that little lamb right there, began to inspect him to see if he was kosher to be the Messiah. If you're the Messiah, tell us. Are you acceptable? So the same time that the lamb was being inspected, inspected by the priest, those same priests was inspecting Jesus, just the way the Bible says. Now back in Egypt, they inspected for four days, and then on the 14th day of the first month, this is when you slaughtered the lamb that died to deliver all the people. So through this death, all God's people got delivered. Now at the temple, the way that this was done, at 9 o'clock in the morning, the selected, inspected lamb on the 14th day of the first month at 9 o'clock in the morning over the third hour was taken up on top of the altar, on the northwest horn of the altar. Very important, northwest horn of the altar. He was bound hand and feet so he couldn't break, uh, break any bones and was attached to that northwest horn on the altar. But he wasn't slaughtered then. He was only attached to the altar at nine o'clock in the morning, both hands and feet. Then they would inspect him all day long, but then at the ninth hour, at three o'clock in the afternoon, when the Bible says in Exodus chapter 12 that he is to be slaughtered, the high priest would ascend the altar at the ninth hour and he would slaughter it there, and then the priest would make a proclamation. He said, it is finished. Now, the same time that this is going on, on the north, northwest corner of Jerusalem, a man, both priest and the true Lamb of God, at 9 o'clock in the morning was attached hand and foot to the altar. Exactly. This is We're still studying the book of Acts chapter 1, by the way. This is when he suffered. And the same time when the priest would say it is finished at the ninth hour being at three o'clock night, guess what happened? The Bible tells us about Jesus. At the ninth hour, three o'clock, he bowed his head, gave up the ghost, and said, it is finished. Wow. And this happened 1,400 years apart. Prophecy. This is what Acts 1 and 2 is the foundation. You've got to build on this foundation of these feasts or you're missing it. Any text taken out of context becomes a pretext, and a pretext is something other than the text. 
It's a gospel that is no gospel, as Paul said. This is the foundation according to Dr. Luke. Wow, these are the things that Jesus did. What happened then? Well, if you go back in Egypt, what happened after they that night on the Feast of Unleavened Bread? This is when they ate the lamb with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. That night is when they left, but they couldn't leave until the last plague. In Egypt, that's when the death angel come over and the firstborn of the non-believers, the one who didn't believe God, died. But through that death of the firstborn, God's people got delivered. That just happens to be on the Feast of Unleavened Bread the same time that Jesus was put in the tomb. The same time. Is this pretty good or what? And through the death of God's firstborn, he set all of us free. The death of the firstborn said that, we're going, that God has decided to deliver his people through death of the firstborn. Wow. Back in Egypt, they left that night. And a lot of people don't get this, but they went three days into the wilderness. Then they come face to face with the Red Sea. And they said, Moses, why have you... And it's, here's the, the, the congregation jumping on to the pastor. Why have you let us out here just to die? Weren't there enough graves back there in Cairo? So God says to Moses, tell them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But as we talked here, the Hebrew doesn't suggest that God says stand still. Literally, the passage says, shut up. Quit murmuring. Shut up and see the salvation of the Lord that you'll see today and just keep moving forward. That's what happened on the Feast of First Fruits. They went through the Red Sea on dry ground and God's people on the third and the appointed day on the Feast of First Fruits, God's people was delivered by the blood of the Lamb and the, and the uh, rabbis actually say that they sung a new song. They called it the, either the Song of Moses or the Song of the Lamb. And what was the song that they all sung? I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Wow. That happened on the Feast of First Fruit. But this was on the first day of the week, on the Feast of First Fruit. Guess what else happened? Jesus got up that Sunday morning on the Feast of First Fruit. The same time that God's people were delivered and come up out of the Red Sea, and we're still in the book of Luke chapter 1. Then Luke tells us in the book of Acts in Luke 24, Jesus says, here, I'm going to ascend, but wait. Now the question is, how long did they have to wait for that promise or for the word? Because there is no Hebrew word for promise. It is the word. How long? Well, what's coming? Acts 2. Pentecost. And the model for Acts 2 is in line with these three spring feasts. They're all grouped together that you can't just pick one. You've got to see them together. You see that? And what is the focus of Pentecost, the first one? The giving of the Torah, the word of God. What was the promise? What was the garment? The word of God. Somebody ought to get excited with me. And we're still in the book of Acts. This is your foundation. I hope whoever's watching this will back this up, study this, and then go read the book of Acts. So very important. This is good. Now we can move on. This 40th day ascension is deeply symbolic. Symbolic means what? This is a remez. It is meant to take our minds. It is a hint of something that happened before where on the 40th day, Jesus, he lifted up and he ascended in a cloud, right? Well, what is that bringing us to? It's taking us all the way back to the first Pentecost at Mount Sinai, right here. Now, what does Sinai have to do with somebody, a deliverer, ascending on the 40th day into a cloud? Well, wait a minute, ain't that what the Bible tells us Moses did? And it's interesting because Moses is known as the first deliverer and the Messiah is known as the second deliverer. 
The Jewish people say that even though Moses was a great deliverer, he's not going to be the deliverer that the second delivered uh, Messiah, Jesus, is going to be. And this is what they say. By the first deliverer, Moses, he led a whole people, a nation out of bondage. But by the Messiah, he would deliver a whole world with his deliverance. Not just Israel, but both Gershom too, Jew and Gentile. He's much better. How about that? And they also taught this, we won't get into it, that Moses, through the deliverance, walked across on dry ground underneath the water, but the true Messiah, when he comes, he will deliver by walking on top of the water. So Messiah is better. But Moses, you have to see these two together. It is a remez. It is a hint. Who is the other witness that was ascending in a cloud on the fourth day? Elijah! Our two witnesses. Go back and Restudy our last video. Is this good or what? Israel was blessed when Moses lifted up his hands just the way Jesus lifted up his. This is during the battle when they came across the Red Sea. They were going towards Mount Sinai and they met an enemy of God. Amalek or the Amalekites. Okay? We can get into who they are, but we won't do that. But here Moses... When he lifted up his hands, Joshua said, we're going to do some business here. And God's people prevailed when Moses lifted his hands just the way Jesus lifted his. Exodus 17, and so it was when Moses lifted, what, what's the words here? Lifted up his hands just the way Jesus did that Israel prevailed, they won. And when he didn't lift up his hands, Amalek or Amalek prevailed. Wow. The numerical value for the word Amalekite is the same numerical value in Hebrew as the word doubt. When God's man lifts up his hands like this to bless the people, doubt has to go bye-bye. That's your enemy. Here's Moses, and here comes the enemy of God's people. Here they come. They hate God. They hate Israel, and they hate God's people. There they are. When he lifted up his hands, now watch this very carefully. Just as Moses lifted his hands to bless, so did Jesus. Do you see the Ramez? 40th day, mountain, right? And not only is that the only association between the first deliverer and the second one, but as Moses' face glowed, as we learned last time, so did Jesus's. Can you see the Ramez here, the hinting that Luke is doing on this 40th day? The same thing. Is this good? Here it says this, Exodus 34, 30, when Moses came down, excuse me, the mountain, Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. Matthew 17 says that when they saw him, Jesus, that his face shone like the sun. The shining glory, though, listen very carefully, the shining glory upon Moses' face was the reflection of the glory of the Torah. The Torah is the word of God that Jesus refers to. How many believes this? that the very glow was just a reflection. It wasn't Moses. It was the reflection that the glory that's in God's word was reflecting that everybody else can see. Can we justify this, the integrity of the scripture? What does John 1 say, verse 14? That the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld what? So the glory on Moses' face was just the glory that was reflecting from the word of God. And ours should reflect the same thing because Jesus is the word of God. Amen. The Midrash says this about how humble that Moses, as the scripture says, in the Midrash, Rabbah 84 says, Moses was described as the most humblest man who ever lived. You'll find that in Numbers 12, 3. And therefore the veil was used. He put a veil over his face. Was used actually as a disguise, his honor before the people. Why? Moses did not, listen very carefully, if he's humble, Moses did not want the people to think there was anything special about him. Wow. 
And that, that is why he used the veil when he taught the Torah to the people. The people would then see that the glory on his face was just the result of God's Torah. It wasn't him, right? When we begin to do good works, what happens? People glorify the Father, right? We shouldn't hide it under a bushel, but we should give light to the whole house that men may see our good works and glorify the Father. Wow, by removing the veil, they beheld the glory of the Torah. The Bible says, now listen very carefully. Don't, don't go to sleep on me yet. This is where it gets good. The Bible says that the wisdom of the Torah can even make our born-again faces shine with the same glory. You believe that? I believe that because it's not our glory. It's not our light. It's his light, right? But we need some scripture to back that up with, don't we? The second wisest man ever lived wrote this book in Ecclesiastes. It says this in Ecclesiastes 8.1. Who is like a wise man? Here's the second wisest man ever lived. And he said, who? And if anybody knows anything about wisdom, it's him, Solomon. Who is like a wise man? He says this. And who knows the interpretation of a thing? Watch. A man's wisdom makes his face shine. Can our faces shine? And what is the wisdom of God? It's his Torah. It's not our wisdom, but it's his. It's not our light, but it's his. Right? Look what it does to us when we get in the Torah. And the hardness, and the word hardness here is the same word, our countenance of his face changes from this to this. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. So can that reflection happen to us just the way it did to Moses? Yes. God is no respecter of person. The Bible says there will be many like Moses. Do you believe that? There will be many like this deliverer Moses, the first one. Many deliverers with shining faces. Obadiah says this, the prophet. Look what he says, but you've got to read it in Hebrew. Obadiah 1 verse 21. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion. The deliverers, plural. Wow. For what purpose does Obadiah say that all these deliverers will ascend Mount Zion? Now watch this. To judge the mountain of Esau. And what are they going to do according to Matthew chapter 23? They will sit in the judgment seat of who? Moses. And then what will happen? The kingdom will be the Lord's. But boy, when you read this about this plurality of deliverers, there's something that is lost in the English again. It says this in Hebrew, Ba'alu Moshim Bahar on the Mount Zion. But the word translated here in English delivers is this word, Moshim. What is Moshim? It's not just Moses, Moshe, but it's masculine plural, Moses is many like Moses. Wow. And their face is going to shine because they're going to be many like Moses who has a radiance about their face. How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us so. Is this good or what? But it won't be your light and your good works. It will be the revelation of the Torah. Here, Moshim simply means the plurality of Moses. There'll be many like Moses, many believers or deliverers like Moses with shining faces. So now we're going to do another hermeneutic. This is Ramez, and it is the numerical values. What is the numerical value of the many Moseses, the plurality of Moses, Moshim? And you, if you're taking notes, you need to write this number down. 466 is the numerical value of deliverers or Moshim. Many deliverers or many like Moses. And what is it hinting? It's hinting to any other word or, or phrases that has the same numerical value. <coughs> Here it has the same numerical value as the word Naharu Kapanehim. Naharu Kapanehim. It has the same numerical value. So these deliverers are connected to this. It is a hint 
at what's going on here. And as you can see, it is the same numerical value. So what is this word that is uh, attached or to be seen in the same light as the plurality of many Moseses? What is it? This is it. As if their faces radiated with light. Just the way Moses is dead, these deliverers. But we need some scripture with this, don't we? Okay. In the Psalms, it says this, in Psalms 34, 5, they looked to him, God. So they lifted up their head. They looked to him and were what? Radiant. This is our same word, Nahar. Nahar. But boy, this word radiant, if we understand what this is, when we look up to God, the reflection of his light reflects off of radiant. Nahar is this kind of light. Nahar is the word that means reflection of light shining off of flowing water. That when the sun light from above hits it and it hits our face, it's a blinding light, a dancing light. Our faces, when we look up to him like that, will radiate with his glory and not ours. So let me ask you something. Can our faces glow the way Moses did? But it won't be yours. It'll be his. <laughs> That's pretty good. And that goes on and it mentions face here. And their faces will never be ashamed. Right there in the word of God. Now when we read the Aramaic text of Psalm 34, uh, 5, and here's the Targum of Psalms. I didn't bother opening it up. I can do that if you want. But what does it say? And this is just the Aramaic text taken from Hebrew. What does it translate Psalms 34, 5 in Aramaic? And I think they, because the Aramaic gets the gist of what's being said here. This is the way that 34, 5 is translated. They lifted up their heads. <laughs> they lifted up their heads to God in prayer and their faces were shining. That's pretty good, eh? Nahar. That's good. The Bible says a wise man's face reflects God's glory. When we look to glory like this, the glory from him shines and our faces, according to Psalms, will radiate his glory like the sun off of the water. Only when we look to our king who has a shining face. And it's not Moses we're looking to. Thank God for Moses. But there's a greater than Moses. And his name's Jesus. And his face will shine forevermore. And if we look to him, the psalmist says that his glory will reflect off of us. Ain't that something? This is the greatest blessing in all the Bible. It is the greatest blessing in all the Bible when God will, when you look up, make his face shine unto you. Wait a minute, that sounds a little bit like the ironic blessing, don't you? Which, by the way, is this week's Torah portion. <laughs> so Jesus when he's lifting his hands and blessing them, has to be seen in the light of this week's Torah portion. And what's he blessing them with? The ironic blessing. Wow. Now, Luke chapter 24 really starts spraying off the page, don't it? There's more to it. Lifting up of hands and the lifting up of heads. So we need to find out what this blessing is. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. We do it here all the time. Now we're going to see what it's all about. The Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to do what? So let me ask you again, can the Lord's glory reflect off of ours? It is the blessing that God promises. The Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up. What's the words here? Lift up, not so. <laughs> so Jesus in Luke 24 46 through 50 is looking back to the Torah portion and say, this is what I'm doing. And the Jewish people, his disciples knew just like that. And you won't know Acts 1 and Acts 2 until you know what he's doing here. Wow, that's pretty good, ain't it? So the Lord lift up Naso, his countenance, upon you and give you shalom. If you'll notice here, grace always comes before peace. I'm going to say that one more time. Grace, God's grace always comes before your peace. 
You can't have peace without the grace. He will be gracious to you and he'll lift up his countenance upon you and then give you peace. What's very important about this blessing, this is the only blessing that God himself dictated in all the Bible. With all the blessings that there is in the Bible, it's the only one that God penned himself. The chapter, the verse before this, verse 23, it says that God speaks to Moses. He said, tell your brother, the high priest, in this way you shall bless my people. So Moses runs out and he gets a piece of paper. I said, okay, I'm ready. So God dictates this blessing. You get it? Now, there's a lot of things hidden in this, just the way all Hebrew does. English, we miss it. This is one blessing, but guess what? It has three parts. What? His face shining upon us is a three-in-one blessing right here in the Hebrew Scriptures. The first one, the first part of the blessing, number one, the Lord bless you and keep you. In Hebrew, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Right? The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Okay? Okay? And the last one, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you is this. Yesha Adonai Panevaleka by your same Lacha Shalom. Amen. So here is the three in one blessing, but we're going to look at each one individual. What is this three in one blessing? The first one says, The Lord bless you and keep you. Now, in a household, whose duty is it to bless? It's the Father. To bless and to keep, the Bible tells us, is the responsibility of a father. Okay? Just as Abraham passed down the blessing to Isaac. Right? It was his responsibility to pass down the blessing. So this is a blessing of a father. But what's interesting that there's three Hebrew words that make up this father's blessing. And the number three is a, uh, is a number of divinity or divine. So who is this father that he's talking about? God. God the Father. So the first part of God's blessing here is a blessing of the Father. The blessing of a father. Now the second one here, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Make his face to shine upon you, right? Now in Israel, in Israel, the understanding is this, that the face of the son or the face of the father can be seen in the face of the son. If you want to see this, uh, Jesus' disciples said, show us the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the face of the Father can be seen in the face of the Son. Why is this grace to you? Because how many Hebrew words is in the second part? Five. What is the number five? Grace. grace. Making your Father's face shine upon you as a son is his grace. So this second one what? The face of the Father is seen upon the Son. The face of the Son. So this second part of this three-in-one blessing is a blessing of the Son. The first part, the first one is the blessing of a Father. The second one is the blessing of a Son. How about the third one? The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace. Ye say, Adonai Panei Veleka Vayasem Lekas Shalom. He would give you peace. I like to say Selah after that, a double portion of it, and you'll see why that I say that. Okay? Here is the word panave. Some say panave. If you see the Hebrew here, the valve does not come before the yod. It can't be that, but that's the way most people pronounce it. Panave, it is not. If you'll read it there in Hebrew, if you can read Hebrew, it's uh, panave. Ends with a V, panev. Okay? This is the word translated as his countenance or his presence on earth. What is God's presence on earth? His, his Holy Spirit. He left it. He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you a comforter, right? So it is his spirit. I will put my spirit 
upon you, shall lift up the spirit upon you. Now what's interesting, how many Hebrew words make up this third blessing? Seven. Wow, what does that remind us? Zechariah got this when he says, Not by might, not by power, but by my sevenfold spirit, said the Lord God of hosts. And what was he looking at? The seven branch menorah. What is it? It is the sevenfold spirit of God. So this last one is the blessing of what? The Holy Spirit. So in this one, three and, three and one blessing, the first one is the blessing of the Father. The second one is the blessing of the Son. Third one is the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You're not supposed to be able to see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in that old Bible. <laughs> Boy, right there it is. And who penned it? God He's declaring the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right here from the beginning. He said, Moses, don't mess it up. Make sure I'm going to spell check you now. Three in one. But there's more. There's more of what God is doing for us. He's going to make his face shine upon us, little deliverers. Three in one. Mike asked us, What's at the center of this three one blessing? Well, let's start at the top. Number one, the first line, the blessing of the Father. There's three words. What is the center of that? Well, it's this word, Yahweh. Adonai or Yahweh, okay? The next line, what's the center of it? Well, it has five words, so you would have two on one side and two on the other. So here, the nave. Face, right? God's face is at the center. Well, how about the last one that has seven words in it, in this three and one? That means you'd have three on one side and three on the other side, and Elecha is there. So what is at the heart of it? Right here it is. But that's not really the very center. That's only vertical, Right? We need to get horizontal there, don't we? So we go to the center one, number two, and what is the center of it? Right here. You see that? So what is at the center of this three-in-one blessing? It is a cross. And if you'll notice, look up and down vertical here. You see the first word up at the top? That's vertical. But what is the first word horizontally? Well, it's the same thing. Well, how about the second word going vertical? It's the same one as horizontal. How about the third line? What is the center? Alecha. Well, what's the third one in, in, in the second line? Exactly the same. The cross is the same vertical and horizontal. The same words. And what does it say? What is at the heart, at the center? He says it twice. What is it? This is a double portion. Simply says the Lord's face is upon you. A double portion of his face that glows. Is this good or what? Now, of course, we've got we to gotta finish now when we get down to the end of it here. We have to do a, a numerical value. Yahweh is 26, Penev 146, Alecha is 61. And what is that total? 233. Now it's a double portion, so the same words is the same numerical value up top. So it's the same, ain't it? The, what is this shining, glowing upon our face? If we add them together, what do we get? Where have we heard 466 before? The numerical value of the deliverers of Moshim is the same word. Little Mos Moshe's with their face glowing when they look up and he lift his hands to bless them. <laughs> oh, and that one blessing, and what do you think Jesus is doing in Luke 24? This, right here. The Lord's face is upon you twice, and there he is. And what... What is another 466? What is the hermeneutic? Is the phrase here. It has the same numerical value, 466, as we come to an end here. 
It has the same numerical value. So the, the plurality of Moses' face and the, and the deliverers is the same as this phrase. Panay she Yahweh. And what does that mean that's uh, tied to this? He whose face is the Lord will shine upon us. Even our face will glow of the Torah, of the glory of God. What's still at the center of this blessing? Let's go back because there's one more thing that we want to look at that's still in this one blessing that Jesus is doing in Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom or peace. It goes on to say in the next verse, so they shall put in this way, when you do this blessing, you shall put my name, God says, upon the children of Israel, and I, the Lord, will bless them. How many wants the name of the Lord upon him? Remember, in Hebrew, a name's not what you call. What, so his, God's name is his works. How many wants God's works upon his forehead? I want the works of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that's encapsulated in that. I have that kind of works, Okay. But the rabbis took this to heart, how to put the name of God upon their forehead. The rabbis would lift their hands as they bless. Who else did that? Jesus did that. Same thing. He was invoking this upon them. Luke 24. The rabbis would lift their hands as they bless. They wouldn't just lift because they had to put the name of God. So what they would do in their hands, they would do this. And any Star Trek people knows what that is, live long and prosper. But this is the letter Shin or Sheen. And they would put them together like this because they were going to invoke the shining light of God's name upon the foreheads of the people. And what they would do, they would raise their hands. Wait a minute, didn't Jesus raise his hands? And didn't Moses raise his hand? Did Aaron instructed to be lifting up his hands like this? It was like this to put God's name on their forehead. Ain't that something? Just like that. And there's more about that we could say. So they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, upon their foreheads, and I will bless them. So what is in this blessing? Well, this is what this represents. The shin or sheen. This letter is the name of God. So what the rabbis do after they would invoke the blessing like this, they would dip their finger in oil, anointing oil, and go and literally go and put this letter upon the foreheads of all the people. In this way, you shall put my name upon their foreheads. Wow, where have we heard that before? So they would lift their hand. So his name on their forehead is for two things, to seal them, and for protection. So they were sealed with his name on their forehead, with this mark on their forehead, so that nothing could hurt them. Man, where have we heard that for? How about in the book of Revelation? Now we know this in the book of Revelation. Look what he says in the book of Rev Revelations. Sealed in the forehead, Revelation 7 says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth. So they were coming to destroy things and the sea, saying, what did he say? Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed them with what? His name the servants of God in their forehead. With this blessing. Wow. So this blessing is for protection also. Even Rabbi Jesus lifted up his hands to bless. Right? Let's go back to our text and we'll call it a day. Has this been good? Luke 24, Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, the Mount of Olives, and he lifted up his hands. Boy, we know what that means now, don't we? He lifted up his hands and he did what? I wonder what he blessed them with. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Because the three in one is there for protection. So here he leads them out. Watch carefully. Their heads are lifted up and his hands are lifted up. 
And we get that from this week's Torah portion. Not so. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Is that good? Then what happened according to Luke? Then he parted from them and was carried up to heaven with the promise I'm coming back. That happened. His anniversary was this past Thursday. He went out. But then the two men robed in white said to these people, why are your heads still lifted up? This same Jesus will return in like manner. As First Thessalonians 4 tells us, he went away in a cloud and he'll come back in a cloud just like this. Amen. The blessing of the lifting up of heads and hands. Have you enjoyed the Torah portion? Why don't you give the Lord a hand? Thank you for watching Christian's Hebrew Connection with Gary Hump. We would like to thank our sponsors who make this program possible, the partners of the Hebraic Global Community. And once again, thank you for watching Christian's Hebrew Connection with Gary Hump.